Thank you all for coming out uh, to the Flint Library today. We don't usually have programs on a Sunday afternoon, but this is such a special occasion, we have to do this. Uh, I'd like to thank a couple of people. I'd like to thank the Friends, a full volunteer organization that allows us to do uh, great things that we wouldn't normally be able to do, so thank you to the Friends. I'd like to also thank Heavenly Donuts for donating the coffee and the donut holes today. We really appreciate that. And I would like to stop my introductions. I am not usually starstruck. Usually I'm just really cool and calm, but I'm so starstruck today. I'm like, I'm like shaking. So. <laughs> um, so today we're going to do something a little bit different, a conversational style. We have two fabulous authors. Um, I'd like to read their bios before they begin. Some of you may know Hank Phillippe Ryan. Um, she is the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH TV. She's won 34 Emmys, 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors in groundbreaking journalism. A nationally best-selling author of 10 mystery novels, Hank has also won multiple prestigious awards for her crime fiction. Five Agathas, two Anthonys, the Daphne, two McCavities, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her newest book, Trust Me, comes out in August. And now, <laughs> I am so excited to introduce my friend. We hung out last night, so I think it's just a deep. Thank you. Jeffrey Deaver is a former journalist, folk singer, attorney, and now he is an international number one best selling author. His books are sold in 150 countries and have been translated into more than 25 languages. He has sold 50 million books worldwide. The author of over 35 novels, three collections of short stories, and a nonfiction law book, he's received or been shortlisted for dozens of awards around the world. Jeff is currently the president of Mystery Writers of America. His newest book, The Cutting Edge, is going to be released on April 10th. So please, please welcome Hank Phillip Ryan and Jeffrey Deaver. Friends of the library, the library, and uh, and all of you wonderful folks and some great family people who came to see me when I was sitting in the back. Um, I've been writing full time now for uh, 30 years, novels for 30 years, and but been writing fiction for about 40 years, and I still get that uh, chill down my spine uh, that I got when I published my first book a long, long, long time ago. And they saw it up on the bookshelf, or at the time, the two people came to my first sign. <laughs> but you know what? They came to see me, and they get their book signed. And that, um, I'm, I'm happy to say that has never uh, 
diminished when I see people uh, who have uh, read something I've, uh, I've written and had, uh, you know, uh, obviously a somewhat positive response because here you are. It makes it all worthwhile. You know, sitting in the dark room, as you know, for uh, hours upon hours and wrestling with, is this the right word to put in the, the paragraph? Is this the right paragraph to use? Is this the right chapter? Is this the right character? And so uh, a certain sense of uh, validation. I mean, you were saying, I've heard you say, being a writer is like having homework every day. Um, yeah, it is. Sorry, guys. If, uh, those of you who are aspiring novelists. But, you know, think if, if we want to continue that, that analogy, think back to the one course you liked in school. And it may have been because of Miss Swanson, the teacher you had a crush on in fourth grade, and you never got over it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring up anything personal. But, but, you know, we all did have that one subject that we liked that may have been math, not in my case, or science, not in my case, but, but English or classics. I love, believe it or not, I love Latin. Um, and um, that's the kind of homework this is like. So there is an element of, well, you've got to do the work, of course, do the, you know, write down in the worksheets or whatever. But nonetheless, it, um, it's the kind of thing that can sustain you. And probably like you, because of your profession and your uh, skill as a fiction writer, you, boredom doesn't work well with you. You get bored easily. I get bored easily. And, um, you know, when the, the, I fly a lot, I've flown 47,000 miles this year. I don't so far. And, uh, you know, do you think you're impressed? United Airlines loves me. <laughs> but, um, you know, when the pilot comes on the uh, intercom and says, oh, ladies and gentlemen, there's, have you ever noticed it's, it, they give away too much information. They, they don't say, I'm sorry, there'll be a slight delay. That's okay, we can deal with that. But he says, you know, the fire alarm switch isn't working. <laughs> I, I don't need to know that. You know, but anyway, I, I digress. But it, might give you, it might give you an idea for a novel. I was on a play, I, was on a, I started one of my novels, Airtime, cleverly called, um, with the line, it's never a good thing when the flight attendant is crying. <laughs> So everything is a possible story. Everything Everything's is a possible, a possible, story. possible story. But uh, the other thing about that is that you, if you've got a, a, a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, you can work. You can create something. And so those hour-long delays, wherever you might happen to be, driving in the back of a, a car somewhere. I have. Um, I do travel around the world a lot. And I have voltage converters that work everywhere. So I'm on trains, airplanes, cars, writing. Um, you know, people say, uh, Mr. Deaver, where do you get the discipline to write? It's not discipline if you love it. Those same people should see the dishes in my sink. <laughs> my, did you know grass can grow this high? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there is this sort of writer thing that when you're in the moment of writing, that the time really just vanishes, that you look up and it's three hours later, and you look at what you've written, I mean, um, and wonder how that, I mean, you, you know how it happens, because you know what you're, you know where you're going, but talk about, I'll t and I want to talk about your process a little bit too, but talk about the, your writer brain, where do, you know, how, where stories in our imagination come from. Sure, well, thank you, Hank. Um, uh, I've been uh, teaching uh, a course around the country for Mystery Writers of America, and if any of you are, uh, are writers um, or uh, uh, have a great interest in books, you can join different levels of the MWA. It's a wonderful organization. And I, uh, um, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. I, can, I do teach the, um, what I would say is the mechanics of writing, which I do believe can be taught. But there's one thing that you, you can't teach, and that's simply an imagination. Now, 99% of the people have very vivid imaginations, and by learning how to write and structure that, they can create very good poems, short stories, songs, novels, and so forth. But there is that one element, and that's the one thing that's inexplicable, and I cannot describe where it comes from. It is, you know, there is some magic in this business. I mean, Sue, Grafton, Sue Grafton does call it magic. She flat oh, out explains really? that oh, she does, okay. and that's exactly the word that she uses too, because there is a thing that happens that's different when someone like you has a, an idea that you can make, you can make happen, you can make it happen. Um, did you always want to be, did you always want to be an author? Is your agent calling you? 
No, I was. <laughs> I used to make a joke about. I, I got that out because, I, unfortunately, like uh, all of you, were kind enough to shut your ringer drums off, and I wasn't thinking. I was so amazed that these many people came to see us all that. Crowd. But I used to make a joke because. Uh, you know this thing called wristwatches that some people have? I was talking to my nieces the other day, 8 and 11, and I said, I made the, the uh, I, I used the phrase, well, uh, honey, we've got to, we're going to go clockwise here. She said, what? <laughs> so I put, uh, that's, this is my new phone, uh, and that's also my watch. Uh, but I, I used to joke that, uh, oh, no, no, I'm just using it as my timepiece, unless and I'll tell you the name I, that I used, because it was a joke five years ago, unless Harvey Weinstein calls, and, and, and then I'm going to ignore you. But now I can't say that anymore, of course. Uh, it's hard to, actually, it's hard he to use He might call any. you because he needs a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't represent him, no, no. Actually, I might. I'm such an incompetent lawyer at this point. <laughs> Your career has been through being a lawyer and through being a journalist and came out the other end sort yeah. of with all that experience as a writer. Is, is that where you thought you would wind up? I knew at age 11 I was going to be a full-time novelist. Not wow. a, not How a, did you know that? that? What happened? Did you read? Was there something that you read that you I, loved? Or what happened? I, uh, well, it came about from a couple different things. First of all, I loved story. I love the idea of story. Now, I was a nerd when I was growing up. And I, but I was a nerd when the word nerd meant something. You know, nowadays you're a nerd, you're Zuckerberg worth a billion dollars, or you're Bill Gates worth twenty billion dollars, or however much they're worth. I was a, uh, a, a true nerd, I was pudgy, clumsy, socially enough. The girls uniformly ignored me. Cheerleaders and pom-pom girls I had no hope for whatsoever. Um, I would be out in the, in, in sports, they would put me, of course, in the outfield where I could do the least damage. And if I may, I, I think I can remember this, I would be paying no attention to what was going on, but I would, like, compose poems. And, and you know, write craft little stories. And one of them was was something like this. It wasn't a certain. Let's see. The score is tied. Three boys on base. I see the batter's happy face as he grips the bat and looks my way. All I can do is hope and pray that he won't hit the ball my way. <laughs> but we all know how it goes. He hits to me and it breaks my nose. Uh, but but I mean, okay, probably I wasn't writing that in the outfield, but. You get the idea. This is what I was doing. And so, yes, they hit the ball, and I look up at it, and I kind of cringe, of course. And then I look past it and say, you know that cloud? That, that, reminds, me of, that reminds me of a troll to war to the rings, and the ball would go over there. Anyway, I, I digress. Um, I, Let me just tell you, though, it's, it's so funny, and I wonder how many authors have the experience of being, you know, geeky, nerdy in, in high school. And this sort of feat, I mean, as a result of being you know, your counterpart, I, am not, I was voted in high school, in, in middle school, not most likely to succeed, but I was voted most individual. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and they put, I was so weird, they put my picture in the school paper upside down. Oh. <laughs> to, because I was so, because I was such a misfit. I mean, they wouldn't do that today, it's really... A badge of honor. <laughs> you know, now, yes. But in 1964, you know, when all you wanted to do was be like everybody else, um, it was bad. But, but as a result, I, of having never had a date in my entire high school career and went to the prom with the, with the exchange student, um, <laughs> I stayed home and read. You know, I read That's everything. Exactly. I devoured everything on my parents' bookshelves. I swiped Marjorie Morningstar because I thought it was going to be racy, and I and all. <laughs> All Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes and Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay, you know, all those stories. I mean, is that what you did too? Well, um, we may have been siblings separated at birth because uh, <laughs> it sounds, it sounds very I identical. Uh, and I was just about to say that we could have gone to the prom together, but that makes the sibling thing a little dicey. So <laughs> I prefer it. But no, I read and read and read. And my parents had a very interesting rule when my sister and I were growing up. Uh, they, first of all, they encouraged our creativity. My sister is a young adult writer and a very talented artist. My parents encouraged that. But um, they had a, a curious rule um, that we could read anything we could get our hands on. But there were some movies we could not see. Now this was ironic, to say the least, because back in the 1950s and early 60s, movies were all, at, at worst, PG rated. I mean, they weren't even M or whatever, mature R rated, no, that, that, was not, that was inconceivable. But books were um, Henry Miller, 
a nice neat. I mean, you know, some of this is, what we could say, erotic literature. And of course, you know, I picked that up. And, and there was a certain point, you know, let's say at 8, 9, 10, I'm reading the James Bond books, and I get to the part where, oh, could you believe it? He kissed a girl. <laughs> Dreadful. Get to the car chase. Now, when I was 13, those are the scenes I went back to, of course. But, but it, I'm just saying, it instilled in, in myself this um, uh, sense of, uh, uh, of books are good, and you should embrace them, and you should read them, and we're not going to censor anything. And uh, they filled a huge part of my life. But it also made your brain, it also sort of trains your brain as a writer to know what it feels like to tell a story, how a story is supposed to go. I mean, do you draw on that still, do you think? Oh, sure. In fact, when I, I teach um, the, the, the writing courses, um, one of the uh, points I, I make is that we have to continue our education continually. Um, writing is like having homework every day for the rest of your life, and it's like having a skill you need to practice every day for the rest of your life and learn from. And you know surgeons, uh, a, a surgeon, uh, say a, an ace neurosurgeon, uh, she doesn't stop uh, when she graduates. She continues with continuing education and goes to seminars and learns about the new equipment and so forth and goes back for training. Writers, I think, have to do uh, exactly the same thing. And so I say, find a book you like, I don't care whether you publish you know, 10 books or 100 books or whatever, find a book that you admire and tear it apart. I mean, literally, um, but I mean, outline it, study it, uh, embrace did you, it. Did you do that? Oh yeah, 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 what, all the time. What, at what point, all the time? No, if, if it was something that I thought I wanted to mimic, because I was writing at, at 10 or 11. Uh, what did you write at 10 or 11? Uh, adventure stories. <laughs> I used to read, um, at the time I was, was reading James Bond, I read Travis McGee, I read Johnny McDonald, um, I read well, Johnny McDonald, Travis McGee books. Um, I read um, um, some of uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote the Tarzan series, but he also read a, uh, wrote a great series called Pellucidar, about a, a world underneath the uh, surface of the earth. I read uh, a lot of science fiction. and But I had the, the chutzpah to try to mimic some of this, but change it if I didn't if I didn't like the ending. I go I love movies too, as I'm sure you did. And uh, you know, we'd go to see a John Wayne movie and then come back and I would round up the kids in my neighborhood. And no, my neighborhood was not, you know, stickball or softball or anything. Oh it's got Jeff's gonna be a director. Oh my God. And I would rewrite the endings of the films. You know, I didn't want John Wayne necessarily to uh, uh, you know, murder all the Native Americans and then ride off into the sunset. Uh, you know, I, I'm not saying it was politically correct. It just didn't seem like a good creative choice. And, uh, and it's so, predictable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was it was not a uh, really a truly compelling uh, story. So uh, the the uh, my poor neighborhood kids, they, I, I'm sure they fled when they saw me coming because they weren't going to do anything like hopscotch. No, I've got to be the Native American, which frankly we didn't say back then. I've got to be the Indian. And, and, and okay, we're going to be you're going to be cavalry. And then I remember poor Sarah. She had to be the, uh, uh, you know, the, ho the housewife with these, and she had to wear the little hood like they wore in, uh, you know, like, like, uh, I don't know, the housewives in Laura Ingalls Wilder books, that bonnet and so forth. She wanted to shoot them up. Anyway, I digress. Again. No, no, the digression is good. But now your characters, you know, unlike Sarah, now your characters will do what you want them to do without complaining. Oh, it's great. And if they don't, I kill them. <laughs> I got a question the other day uh, if you uh, crafted a, a character in your book, and I, I work largely with an outline, and I, I, I know what the character is going to do according to my um, my outline, and the question came up: What if the character doesn't want to do what you want him or her to do? And I said, I kill them. They're, they're the next it's really interesting to talk with you about the writing process because our our ways of writing books are so opposite. And it, it worries me a little that you've sold 50 million books doing it your way. <laughs> and I took it the other way. But all right, that aside. Um, because I have no idea what's going to happen next in the novels. And I, I start with a gem of an idea. And I don't know until the next sentence and the next paragraph and the next scene what will happen. So people say, wow, the ending of Say No More, you really surprised me. And I'm like, yeah, wasn't that a surprise? You know, talk about a surprise ending. I surprised myself. But let's go back to you. <laughs> what was the first book you ever wrote? And what was it, the first real book, first commercial fiction book that you wrote, and what was it that made you think, I can do this now? Um, 
the, the first book actually was out of genre for me. It was a horror book uh, called Voodoo. And I'll, I'll tell you the premise very simply. Um, there was a, uh, a young woman who uh, uh, visits a Caribbean island and um, becomes unconscious. And um, when she wakes up, she, she knows something's wrong. And she had been in an area where there were uh, Santeria or you know, voodoo or hoodoo rituals. And uh, she's a, a New Yorker, and she's a rationalist, and she doesn't believe in any of this kind of stuff at all. And the symptoms are neurologic. Um, but they're also uh, like a um, behavior that might be defined uh, as uh, somewhat paranormal. So we, we, don't, we don't know which it is. We're kind of leaning toward the fact that she is... Uh, in fact, uh, suffering psychotic breakdown. She's been through some trauma. Maybe when she fell, she caused some, some damage or some sort. Uh, and to make a long story short, um, the uh, two people who can save her at great loss to their own personal lives is a neurosurgeon at Columbia or a Columbia wannabe medical uh, 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 hospital in New York City, and a, a mambo, which is like a, a priestess, a Buddha priestess. And uh, in fact, there is a certain element of possession, but there are, there's also a, a, a mental thing. And of course, the, the Mambo's um, uh, the coterie says, no, no, you have to reject all science, all rational science. The neurosurgeon becomes a pariah because he says, you know, there may be a paranormal element to this, but together, only they can save her. And I, uh, I as to, as to the, that was the idea, and you know, it's, a, it's certainly a workable uh, sci-fi kind of Stephen King idea, but as to the thought about whether or not I could write it, never ended the equation. It's okay. Here's a book. I'm going to write it. So you had this idea, yeah. Um, and interesting, and you decided you could just do it. Did that book yeah. sell? Did that, was that book published? No, but I will tell you something. Interesting. <laughs> um, we've all heard about the uh, collection uh, of books. And the, um, uh, the value that the first edition has is in direct uh, correlation to the sparsity of that book. So this book, the print run was so small, the sales were so small, I got back, uh, I asked the publisher, what, what are you going to do with the books? He said, well, we pulp them. And that was a term of art that I didn't know, but you can kind of figure out what happens. And I said, well, can I have them? So if I sent them the posters, they sent me boxes and boxes. So I have about a thousand copies of this uh, book out of a print run of like 1100. <laughs> but if you, go to, if you go to eBay nowadays, because there were so few of them, it's not a particularly brilliant book. Uh, the cover is absolutely horrific, but it was rare, so it's like $500, $500 on eBay for these things now. And I've got them socked away just in case. <laughs> but hey, to, to be serious about it. I, um, and maybe like, like you as well, and I, I, I do want to talk about you a little bit, but I, um, I just did not accept the fact that I could not write the book. It, it just, that didn't even occur to me. I sat down, I didn't know what I was doing, but I'd read all my life, and I had a pretty good idea about uh, how to put together a book. And I sat down and I wrote it with, without outlining, which was one of the, the problems. I, 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 was, I was kind of meandering. I would throw in scenes here that probably weren't, weren't appropriate. But uh, it just it just occurred to me, I'm going to write a book, okay? And I wrote a book. Well, you're the king of outlining. And it's so interesting because now, and you, you say this famously, that your outlines are, are incredibly detailed and incredibly long. And you know Ken Follett, who I bet is a pal of yours, um, said that you know Ken Follett, right? The throwaway. Okay. So I he said that, yeah. So he... Um, he said that when he first started to, when he wrote his first novel, he did it because his car was broken and he needed money to fix the car. And he had a friend who had written a book who had gotten like 275 pounds to fix his car. So he thought, well, I need about 275 pounds. So if I wrote a book, I could get that much money and fix my car, which he did, and he did. Um, and then he did a couple more novels that way. And then he realized that, they, that the books weren't good enough. They just weren't good enough. And he thought maybe he should have an outline. And so he tells the story that he wrote an outline, you know, scene by scene by scene by scene for the book. First time he'd ever done it, and that turned out to be Eye of the Needle. And that he has outlined ever since. So you may have something with this outline thing. You see, my theory is, is this, that uh, books are about structure as much as they are about wonderful prose. And my analogy um, is uh, to a, a symphony orchestra. And um, Beethoven is my god of uh, romantic or classic era music. And 
you know, you don't have the Vivace movements, the really exciting ones, one right after another, because the third one loses its impact. But we have a, um, um, you know, mountaintops and valleys. There's the adagio, the slow movements, the lento movements. And then we all lead up to the big crescendo, you know, da 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 that kind of thing. That most people know, of course, from the end of Die Hard. But still, it is, I know it's not something. <laughs> And, and then at the end of that, so the big drums, and oh, that's over with a big, huge uh, climactic scene, and then there's a little coda at the end, that kind of reconciliation of the themes where we take a deep breath and we reflect on what we've experienced. I think a book should be exactly the same way. And I don't care whether it's you know li literature or uh, a thriller or a murder mystery. A book should be about an emotional experience, and emotions um, require that excitement a slow, thoughtful movement. More excitement, slow, thoughtful. Then more excitement leading up to uh, leading up to that. So anyway, that's structure. That's where this all comes about in the overall schematic of the story. Now you can do that on the fly. The phrase that we often use is pantser, as in you write by the seat of your pants. I have since learned the proper word is organic. I think it's okay. I like pantser myself. You can do that, and people who are smarter. Uh, and more organized than I can do that. Certainly, look at, you know, I love Jack Reacher. I love the Lee Child books. He doesn't outline. I love your books. You don't outline. Harley Coben doesn't outline. But you do that work. Just for me, it's a lot easier to do it ahead of time. And um, and then I can I can also see, well, this book is a false start. When I do the outline, I say, eh, no, it's just not really a book. How many false work. starts do you have? Seriously. I have, I have a lot of false starts. You do. I have a lot of false starts. I have uh, working on a new book right now. I spent about four months on the outline. The idea is viable, and it's under wraps at this point. It'll be my book for next year. I'm not talking about it, but um, it's a viable idea. But the way to structure it is no different than any other book. But I just want to make sure that I get it get it right. And I have thrown out probably four outline starts at this point. Okay, but you throw out the outline, but you don't throw out the idea. Oh, no, no. You just figure out a new oh, way. I have had ideas that don't work. Here's, here's a perfect, may I tell you this perfect example? I wrote <laughs> The Bone okay. Collector, right? Okay, this is great. I wrote The Bone Collector, and uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to, Bone Collector, that's kind of interesting. I'm going to do a sequel to that. Okay. Now, actually, all of the Lincoln Ryan books are kind of sequels in a way, but this was going to be a true sequel to The Bone Collector. And here's, here was my idea. And I have to admit, okay, uh, okay, all right. Having always said, Right, drunk, and, and sober. <laughs> so I, was, I, I think this probably came about after a glass of wine or two. But I said, there, and there are medical people here who may know, I'm not sure, I think there are 106 bones in the human body? 206. Oh, 206. Oh, my God. Okay, uh, that's right. 206, that's right. Because that's why this story will even have more of an impact on me. I said, okay, so I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get, the, each bone has a name, correct? And I'm going to name... I'm going to have 206 chapters in the book, and each one is going to be named after a bone in the body. And it's going to be about this villain roaming around a medical school with a disarticulated skeleton, 206 bones, and leave them as calling cards for his, his crimes. 206 murders? Yeah, I know. That was a lot. Can I mention a glass of wine or two? But, but it was not going to be quite that many murders, but it did commit me to 206 chapters, each one named after a bone. And then, uh, you know, that was about three weeks worth of work, and I said, yeah, let's move on to something else. You still did the bone collector. I did the bone collector, yeah. yeah so that, this, was, this was afterwards. This was after. Oh, okay. yeah, this is going to be a sequel to the... Uh, uh, thank, thank goodness you think you need to do it. Well, go, you mentioned um, Lincoln Ron, but let's just go back to that. Um, because how many of you love Lincoln Rhyme and Amelia? I mean, they are iconic as any <laughs> iconic as any characters in well, thank you, thank you. literature. And I thought it was interesting what you said about the the neurosurgeon and the witch doctor person in your initial book, because that is two people working together, each of whom has um, a bit of knowledge, and working together. They, they work together to, to fix something. And that's exactly what Lincoln and Amelia do. Um, where did you come up with Lincoln Ron? Yeah, um, there's a, um, a joke in Hollywood, although Hollywood doesn't think it's a joke, um, <laughs> where um, when a producer is looking for a, a project, um, they want 
uh, either the script writer or if they're going to get a, a, a book uh, turning out with the film. They want something that has been wildly successful in the past and yet that we've never seen before. <laughs> that's why we see so many sequels, for one thing. And that's, it is kind of a joke, but there's some truth to that. Because I know that my readers want um, my uh, archetypal book, and that's one that takes place over a very short period of time, maybe two or three days at the most. Um, it's got uh, three or four subplots going on at the same time. It's got big su surprise twist endings. Um, and that's my formula. And there's nothing wrong with writing to a formula. I mean, that's, we don't get any cars that haven't been built according to a formula. We don't get any airplanes. Why should we read a book that hasn't been written according to some formula? And so um, with the um, um, facing creating a new book with that in mind, I always want to do something a little different, though. So I want something that's been successful in the past and yet something we haven't seen before. And that means coming up with new, uh, new and exciting ideas. Well, I, I think I had seen a, um, a thriller movie. Um, it's going back 20 years before I wrote The Bone Collector. And, you know, frankly, I just thought I've seen it, been there and done that. And there's always the scene, you know, who doesn't love, you know, shoot 'em up thrillers? You know, like a Bruce Willis or a Tom Cruise thriller. They're great fun. But, you know, you get to the, the end. And so I'll pick on Tom Cruise. I think it was a Tom Cruise. And he was up against Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, the, the true actor playing the, the villain turn. Jeremy Irons does that. And it's gotta be great fun for them. But, so here's, here's Tom Cruise. And um, Philip Seymour Hoffman is the, the bad guy. And he's beating him up. And he's, he picks him up and he throws him into glass, a lot of glass shelves at the ends of these, these thrillers. Okay, a lot, you just throw him and shatter everything. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind in that audience, that at some point Tom Cruise is going to remember where he hit the gun at the end of Act One, or you know he gets a blow on the head and he suddenly has a recovered memory of his father teaching him to kickbox when he was 17, and, and so the family the family angst is now flooded out. He can reconcile this and he gets up and he he, he kicks Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I, you know who doesn't love those things? But I wanted a hero. I decided who didn't do that, who couldn't do that who wanted to outthink the villain. And so I made Lincoln Rhyme um, as a, a brilliant forensic detective, so a la Sherlock Holmes, but um, somebody who, um, who had to use his mind as his only, um, as his only weapon. And uh, you know, the, the, obviously he's become very, very popular. The movie came out. That certainly was a, a huge help for uh, spreading the word about Lincoln Rhyme. But I've been asked a lot, why is he so popular? And I think the answer is not that he's really unique, because he is a Sherlock Holmes character, and you know we have uh, Benedict Cumberbatch doing Holmes now. We see a lot of the um, uh, the you know the thoughtful detective, Kathy Reichs, uh, the Temperance Brennan, and so forth. And, um, so I thought, well, um, we all, in a way, are our minds before we're anything else. Who doesn't want? Let me pick an example: more hair, for instance, <laughs> you know, uh, or some physical thing that we're not all that happy about, or we have some failing or another. That's not really a failing, it's just part of who we are. But it, Lincoln Rhyme represents that we are really our minds and hearts and souls before anything else. I mean, that's quite a philosophical turn for a guy who sends Amelia to, to shoot somebody with, uh, away with or blow somebody away with a Glock. But I think there may be something to that. Well, I do too. And I think, but to set up for yourself, um, do you remember um, Steve Hamilton's book, The Lock Artist, which is a fantastic novel, where the protagonist does not talk? And that's a toughie. And I said to him once, how, how did you decide to have your protagonist not talk? And he said, yeah, I just got a couple chapters in, and he hadn't said anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, um, in, to set yourself up to write um, a thriller where your protagonist cannot move, is a high bar. So you needed a, you needed another you needed a plan, an, an assistant, uh, a pal, a partner, a method of making this work. So how did you come up with Amelia? Uh, yeah, I like the idea as you gathered from my first book, as uh, Hank was mentioning, the uh, um, yin and yang, the two two sides coming together to to create a whole. And um, I also have always. Uh, written as you you write strong men and you're a woman i like to think i write strong women as a man i've always had strong female protagonists 
And I thought this would be a good opportunity for uh, Lincoln, who is immobile and uh, cannot I mean, physically defend himself, cannot physically move without assistance, uh, to be uh, paired with a woman who was um, very, clearly she's in, she's intelligent, she's a good crime scene person, but she she needs the outlet of action. Uh, she's very fidgety. She has a habit. She scratches herself. She's not comfortable in her own in her own body. Uh, although uh, she's attractive, she was a fashion model and rejected that uh, a long time ago. Actually, there were. Um, in, in the bone collector, there were Me Too elements about how she was treated in the fashion industry going back uh, 20 years, and she rejected all of that. But she still has this element that she needs to move. Her her, uh, uh, her catchphrase, which she uh, derived from her father, is, when you move, they can't get you. And that kind of typifies her life. And she's she's a competitive pistol shooter. She drives a muscle car, a car. now it's a Torino. The Camaro didn't survive one book. That was the hardest thing. I don't know my books. I never heard animals. I never heard children. The, the worst thing I ever did was squash her, her, her 69 Camaro SS into one of those cubes. You ever see Breaking Bad? You know how the trailer ended up in this little metal cube? So. But that's Amelia. And she does the, uh, does the light work, literally, and uh, is the, uh, uh, you know, male and female the gender issue is out the window completely. Everybody is everybody. Everybody is everything in my books. But um, that we needed somebody to pull the trigger and hit the accelerator. And it, it's so much. It's so much fun to read those books. And what what you were saying about Amelia's um, motto, father's motto about um, if you if you keep moving, they can't get you, makes me think about that. There's always a they for them. And there's always a they in the books. And in the Jeffrey Deaver book. I mean, he's nice, you see, he's funny. He's but those books, the, the they's in your book, books are really creepy. I mean, they are. Thank you. And there, I mean, there was one, and then I'll ask the question. There was one, in one of your books, the chapter ending of one of the books was nothing but someone plugging in an iron. And, I just, and then that was the end of the chapter. And I just, yeah, right? that and was I just sad. Thought, I just thought, oh, I, no, I don't think so. And of course I went on, but I thought, you know, that's much more terrifying than the graphic illustration of what would happen. But I, what's a nice guy like you doing in a book like that? You know? uh, my, uh, my job is to uh, craft a, uh, as, as you do, uh, our job as novelists is to craft a story that is compelling. Mickey Spillane said people don't read books to get to the middle. <laughs> we read books to get to the end. And it is, it is our obligation to drag readers from the very beginning of the book to the end as quickly as possible. And that requires conflict. And that requires our heroes to be up against um, villains who are, uh, you know, frankly, a little smarter than they are. And, um, you know, have more resources and they have the added advantage of having no moral compunction whatsoever. <coughs> I mean, Lincoln and Amelia are not going to break the law. They may push the limits of police regulations, as is required in books like this, but they're not going to they're not going to break the law. Um, but the bad guys can do that. And so, to create that emotional tension on your part, I have to come up with really, really nasty uh, bad guys. And I, I was on a panel, I think, with, with Michael Connolly. It was some years ago, and. Uh, because uh, he, he creates great villains, too. He was a great writer and creates these wonderful villains. And uh, the question came to us, but how do you guys dwell in the darkness? You know, you write this stuff, and you've got to get into the minds of these serial killers and these nasty people. And we looked at each other, and I can't remember whether he said it or I did, but we, we both we said, well, that's a job. Five o'clock, you shut down the computer, go have a beer. Uh, Oh, like, okay, now you have to talk about, because you may approach this differently. For me, it's like, the switch goes off, I created the bad guy, but now do you actually dwell, and, and maybe as a journalist, you actually do get into the minds of your... Well, you know, yeah, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm writing, if I'm writing, um, you know, my bad guys are not as, would not make, rig an escalator to collapse. You know, my guy, my bad guys would humiliate you and steal your money 
and make your life miserable and then eventually kill you in a kind of a way off the page that wouldn't make you be nervous every time you got into an elevator. Which is, if I mean, you know, <laughs> more, more realistic. I mean, that is the way yes. true yes. evil exists in yes. this world. And my books are investigative thrillers. What, what could happen in real life? Your books are creepy thrillers that could happen in a, in a life that you hope you don't have. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when I'm writing my bad guys, I am I am definitely in the mind of the bad guy. That that I think how he or she thinks. I feel how he or she feels. I know what he or she needs, and I'm putting that um, I'm putting that in the book. And I and I and I've got to tell you that I love you and I love Michael Connelly, but I don't believe that you're not at some point in the mind of the creepy person, and you oh, probably well, are good at getting out of it. Yeah, yeah, certainly you have to be. What I do when I write, I have my outline in front of me. And I look at the outline, and let's let's take a a, a creepy scene. The um, the oh villain, boy. the villain has to. Uh, let's say he's in a nice. I'm making this part up, but let's say he's in a nice idyllic, maybe a library, yeah. with his office or something. And he's sitting next to a, a stranger in a crowd of a hundred or so people. He's never met, met listening to a lecture, thinking about what he's going to do to the person sitting next to him in the parking lot. And, uh, and so, so I'll, I'll see that scene, and I know I have to write it, and uh, I close my eyes. I can touch type, because I was a, a, a print journalist a long time ago, and uh, so I close my eyes, and I start just start typing, and uh, and I do get into that scene. I mean, you have to feel it. That you do. And it's one of the fun things about being a writer uh, that you might have, uh, agree with, that we're very curious people, and you as a, a journalist maybe go one step beyond that, uh, an investigative journalist particularly, because... Um, you are fascinated with people, and you have to understand them and translate who they are for your viewership or in your books for your, your readership. And uh, then, uh, but oh, I will, if anybody wants to do this advice and uh, take this advice, that's a good thing. Just remember what those little bumps on the J and the, the, the G keys are. Be, because when you're typing, if you get your hand over one and your eyes are closed, it's a code that not even Dan Brown can figure out. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. I'm a terrible typer, so when I'm, I'm typing as fast as I can when I'm really in it. I'm really typing fast. And at one point, I'm typing Word. And at one point, the little Word thing came up and said, there are so many grammatical and spelling errors in your document that we can no longer correct it. <laughs> you got rejected by Word. <laughs> Which I can, usually I know. Usually I know um, what I meant. Usually. Um, do you write, I mean, you're a craftsman and you're an artist at the, at the same time. You have this thing that you create that people love. Are, do you think about the, that all of us are reading it, will read it when you're, when you're, as you're writing it? Oh, sure. My, um, uh, my goal is to create something that makes you happy. End of story. Uh, uh, I have a, this rather uh, bizarre conceit. Uh, when I teach the course, and then I, when I teach my course, this is all like Jeff talking to Jeff. I tell people right away, this may not be for you, and go on and do your own thing, certainly if you want. This is just what's worked for me. And uh, I, first of all, I consider it a business. I, I, I manufacture a product. I'm very proud of that product, but it's a product. You know? And we need a business model if it's a product. My business model is the mint flavored toothpaste business model. What do I mean by that? That uh, if I I chose to be a manufacturer and created liver flavored toothpaste because I thought it was neat and I never heard of it before and it's just something I wanted to do out of my ego uh, or insanity because it does sound pretty weird. Uh, that's that's failing the consumers of yeah. of toothpaste and our job is to create a product that works for people. My job is to create a book that works for people and. Um, so I want to write a mint book, something that you're happy about. So I think every day, <coughs> what is going to make readers be excited and scared, yeah. but not repulsed? For instance, um, you know, I don't really like, um, and I respect you for doing this, uh, I don't like gruesome scenes in books. You know, people think my books are gruesome. They actually aren't. You, you see very few scenes of actual murders, never any torture, again, never any children. Never any sadosexualism, uh, never any um, animals uh, heard. Uh, it's like I, I, Hitchcock was my 
I, I, I love this job. But I always think, is, are you going to like this or not? And I wake up every morning, I write every day, I wake up every morning thinking, almost in a panic sometimes, is this going to work? Are people going to like this? Is it going to be too complicated to follow the plot? Is it going to be too simple? Will they be able to get the twist? And I want you to get some twists, but I don't want you to get all the twists. And Or is this scene going to, going to bother them? Or does, does this lean, skew a little bit toward politics that I, I you know, might offend some people? And, uh, you know, it's, I, obviously everybody has political opinions. My book is not the place to preach that. I, but so you have to talk about politics to some extent. Is that going to upset anybody? So I always think about that. I mean, your, your books, I mean, all this comes from you, from you truly caring about what you do and wanting each book to be the best it can be. So when, the, when, you, when you open the box and there's the burial hour, let's say, what, do you think, what, what did you think when you saw that? And are, I mean, what, what is it that you love about that book? About the burial hour? Um, well, a couple things, I, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. My one that uh, just came out from Grand Central Four came out last year, my most recent one. It takes Lincoln Rhyme to Italy, and uh, I go to Italy quite a bit. My books sell uh, sell very well there, and it is. Um, you've heard the phrase "fish out of water." You know, it's a kind of an archetype of a, a detective who. Uh, goes to town. I think Dennis Weaver, that was a classic show. Does anybody remember that? He, he was a cowboy. Yeah, what was it? Called? McLeod. McLeod, yeah. Great, great series. So all of a sudden, or, you know, in the comedy, the Beverly Hillbillies. They were they different, uh, completely different different culture. And so I thought, uh, well, I would take, uh, I'm going to take Lincoln Ryan to, uh, to Italy. And by the way, if anyone here works for the IRS, every one of those bottles of wine I had in Italy, every one of those meals was a legitimate business expense. <laughs> I just want to make sure you understand that. And, uh, but, the, um, but talking about politics, I, uh, you know, we certainly have, have heard, and I'm not going to make, I'm not going to go one way or the other on this, we simply have heard about immigrations in this country. Italy has immigration problems that do not come close. Uh, I mean, ours do not come close to the Italian part. 90,000 at times people a month flood into Italy from Northern Africa primarily fleeing horrific situations. Oh, I mean, not only the drought uh, and uh, famine, but um, uh, uh, religious extremism, torture, and these are people, they're not going to survive in, uh, in northern, uh, in northern Africa, so they have to go to Italy. And that's created uh, just a, a very, very difficult climate. And I thought that's a valid issue to take a look at. And certainly there's some terrorist issues there, but there's more humanitarian issues. And so there's a serial killer who seems to be preying on the immigrants. Is he part of the Italian far right? Is he simply a serial killer? Is there another agenda? And since it's a deeper book, there's, you know, all of those are true and yet not true. I can't say Well, I know, but so you, you talk about it in this erudite manner, and Lincoln goes, and there's this international um, disaster under, underway. But in the, in, the, in the cover copy of the book, in the cover copy of the book, it says something like, um, the video is connected to it, an evil person named the composer. You know, okay. Oh, but it's sick and twisted, Mac. There's no question about that. <laughs> well, let I me mean, well, just get this straight. You, mean, you think there's something odd about a man who does it, a post on it's a YouTube wannabe kind of, kind of site. Um, somebody with a noose around his neck and the police have 10 minutes to find him while he is composed. Um, he plays the, um, uh, the waltz, uh, Dance Macabre, um, with the, the bass beat being the victim's heart beating. Do you think there's anything odd about that? It's a children's book. You know. And the steel kids, talk about that for two seconds. Oh, okay, steel kids. Um, does anyone here have a smart product? And by smart, smart product, I mean a, um, it could be a home security system, it could be a baby monitor, it could be a microwave stove, refrigerator with the Wi-Fi thing enabled in it, so you can have, uh, so, believe me, you do. All, almost all of you could be raising your hands. You, okay, you may not know you do, but you do. Those um, Wi-Fi systems, um, allow, you, you don't know this, I mean, you're not going to see this on your computer, you're not going to see it on your, your smart refrigerator, uh, your heating system, probably your, your um, uh, HVAC system is smart to some extent, your light switches can be smart, you've got Alexa, right? Okay, so um, these are all Wi-Fi enabled. Well, there are um, so many Wi-Fi signals, now, these are being picked up by satellites, 
I'm not a crank. I read this. This is true. They're being picked up by satellites, and people can take control of your smart products because the um, the uh, smart uh, circuits in them are based on old Windows XP security um, systems, uh, you know, security software, and. Um, uh, so I thought, well, that's a good opportunity to scare the hell out of people. <laughs> and so uh, the most, uh, and, and so this, this, you don't have to, even have to be a clever hacker to do it. I mean, if any of you have 13-year-old children, they could yeah. easily do it. You might not be able to, but they could. And so I thought it would just be a good scary thing for somebody to take control of these products. And they happen in industrial services, too. You probably heard about that car that somebody took control of. And, uh, and shut the engine off, and there was nobody was killed, but it was a bad accident. Hackers did that. So this the, the, the guy did it. And I thought, so what's going to be the scariest things in the world? Oh, let me think. Oh, good. Escalators. I hate escalators. You will. You read the book, you'll never get on an escalator. Again. And, uh, no, that's lovely. We thank you. For that. <laughs> uh, he can only, only Jeffrey Diener can make us terrified of a household appliance. Um, let's take some questions. Do you want to take questions from yeah, anybody in the audience have questions? I have a thousand more. If you, if you yes. My name's Suzanne. Thank you for being here. Um, one of the things you had mentioned is that you have a gem of an idea. So what from your life do you encounter that morphs into some type of creation that comes into your life? Sure, the question was, what from my life, uh, this gem of an idea, German of an idea, that, that uh, turns into a, uh, a book? I will say this, there's uh, very little autobiographical in my books, first of all. I, um, un unlike yours. Well, I mean, you're, you're no, unlike, unlike Hank's books, because, but I, um, you know, I'm, I sit in a dark room and I write. And I did have, you know, I was a Wall Street lawyer for a little bit, and I, I was a... Uh, I was a business journalist, not an investigative journalist, not a folk singer, but very little of that shows into the books. My job is to step back and look for ideas that I can turn into books. And sometimes that means reading the newspaper. Uh, sometimes that just means observing things. I was in, um, um, I think it was Vegas, and took uh, my, my girlfriend's son to, um, it was maybe the Big Apple Circus, or it may have been Cirque du Soleil. And there was a, uh, um, a quick change artist there. I've never seen anything like this in my life. He, he walked past a pillar, a little wider than he was. He didn't break stride, and he emerged to somebody entirely different, I, I thought. And you know, we all laughed, we all applauded, and I thought, good, my next book idea. <laughs> Which it was, and it became, a, it, it was a psychotic illusionist who's sitting uh, next to you, and then just, you know, says, oh, I'm so sorry. Meanwhile, he's lifted your, your wallet, keys, oh, no. and replace them with another wallet and keys so you don't feel any different, but then when you go to get in your car, you'll find you're not alone in your car. Uh, little great things like that. So, so I do look for ideas. I mean, they, and sometimes they, just, sometimes they just appear. I mean, and you realize that, and I talk about it sometimes, it's like um, if you drop a pebble in a pond, and a bad idea just sinks to the bottom. And a good idea ripples out and ripples out and ripples out. And you think oh, this well is, said. You know, and when I, for the, my book, The Other Woman, I was in the dentist's office, and I was reading an article, and the end of the article said, you can choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences. And I thought, <laughs> my book, my book, my book, and that turned out to be the other woman. So you sort of hey, never excuse know. Excuse me, that was the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a second. I might want to go someplace else. <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Agatha Christie had two major characters, and at the end, she got really tired of one of them and wanted to focus on the other one. Do you ever imagine saying, Catherine, Lincoln? I'm going to get rid of one of them and just do one of these books. I'm uh, sure the question was about my two main series. Um, I also write standalones as well, but the two main series, Catherine and Lincoln. Agatha Christie got tired of one of her characters and, and, and abandoned uh, that series. Um, I'll tell you why there have not been that many. There have been fewer Catherine Dance books. She's not as popular. Um, I like writing them. I, I, I get I get paid to write stories. I can write, and I'm not saying I'm qualified to write anything, but from my own perspective, I can write anything I want. Lincoln Ryan, Catherine, and my standalones, just because it's it's just wonderful to, to wrestle with the challenge of crafting fiction. But um, more people like Lincoln, uh, and I know this objectively because I'm a business, I look at sales figures, fewer people like Catherine. I'm not abandoning Catherine, 
but she will appear less frequently, and that's kind of the way it has to be, because I, and there's nothing at all wrong with this. There are some authors who write with other people. James Patterson is the classic example. It's absolutely fine to do. I just can't do it. I don't play well with others. And uh, so uh, those Catherine fans out there, I do apologize. You, I will not, I'm not neglecting you. Uh, well, maybe I'm neglecting you a little bit, but I will not abandon you. But, also, but, do you, but you still love Lincoln Ryan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Lincoln's great. Yeah. Uh, you just said that you, uh, you don't work with, you don't write with other people and so forth like that. But you wrote a James Bond novel. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was curious as to how that came about and your interaction with the copyright owners of James Bond, whether they had script approval and all, all that, sure. how that worked out. Yeah, so well, thank you. different from what you otherwise, how you otherwise write out. Right, yeah. uh, Thank you. Uh, the question was about my James Bond novel, and we're re referencing my comment that I don't play well with others. Um, the Bond novel came about because I won an award in England, and... Um, in, in accepting it, I said, well, this means a lot to me because I was very influenced by Ian Fleming when I was uh, a young uh, young boy. And they, the estate heard that. Fleming's been dead for many years. Uh, but there's a company that his family runs it and a, a, a production company and a publication company that run the James Bond franchise. And they called me up and said, do you want to write a, uh, a new James Bond book? And uh, Because other authors have done that, as you know. And... Uh, I said, um, I, I, oh, I'm very honored, I do, but I, I have to tell you how I work. And I mean, talk about chutzpah, but I, I, there's no, no other way I could do this. I said, you know, I don't write a chapter and then hand it in or anything. I do the entire book, then I edit it, I hire copy editors myself before the publisher sees it, I rewrite it 50 times, then it's ready to go to the publisher. I said, I will do an extensive outline for you, and you can reject it. And you maybe make some suggestions on it, and then I do the whole, I do the book for you. And if you don't like it, I, I, you know, had the experience of writing a Bond book that will never be published, and that's okay. But I cannot work with somebody looking over my shoulder. And uh, they said that's fine. And so I did the outline, uh, about a five-page outline, planned the book out, spent uh, a couple months doing that, submitted it to them. They did have a couple of, of changes. And then I sat down and, uh, and wrote the book, and then it was, they, and they had the right to change the manuscript too, but, but I had to get the whole book done. And as it turned out, they didn't really make, uh, they didn't make uh, many changes. Um, it was, um, uh, and, you know, the, the Bond, this whole Bond ethos, this whole Bond world, I went back to the original Bond, which is nothing like the movies. You know, Bond, he, he, he was married, at least once, possibly twice, in, in, uh, uh, when he was over in Japan, we aren't quite sure about that. He wanted to be with somebody, he, 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 but he also knew he'd be dead by the age of 45. He was a very tormented soul. He hated killing people. He was an assassin. You know, the double O didn't mean that if somebody's attacking him, he can kill him in self-defense. He walked up behind people and shot him in the back of the head, and he wrestled with, with doing that. And he uh, was, uh, you know, he, he would, they didn't have... Uh, like uh, you know, psychological departments in the CIA back then, or the British Secret Service back then, but he would, you know, just go on drinking benders for a while after he had, uh, after he had done that. So he was a very complex character, and I wanted to get back to that, and um, I was very happy for that opportunity. And you, all that reading you did as a kid, and I read all of them too, hiding right under the covers, every single James Bond book. Um, let you do that in a way that was just sort of a visceral knowledge, not like research, 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 but there was this basis for that. Yeah, it was, it, but then I, I did take a little bit of flack because uh, Bond's original book was a, oh, I'm sorry, Bond's original car was a Bentley, an old blower Bentley from the 1930s and 40s, a great, great car. And um, at one point, uh, one of the villains uh, destroys the Bentley, or at least damages it badly. So. Uh, here's government money at work. He goes to the Secret Service carpool and gets something available, and you'd think it would be, you know, a, a, a Vauxhall or a Ford or something or a little Cooper. No, it's an Aston Martin, you know, just sitting there. And so, so that's what I suspect because Aston Martin worked out a deal with the Broccoli movie franchise, so he got an Aston Martin. But I gave him a Bentley again, uh, and. Um, 
uh, the flack I took for that. I guess, no, Bond only drives an Aston Martin. And what am I going to do? Cite, you know, from Russia with love, James Bond is driving a blower Bentley. It's a 7.5 liter car. It goes 160 miles an hour. No, they weren't interested in that. So you've got to be very careful with the, uh, you know, the, the, the cannons. And, Maybe one or two more here. We we need, I need to get you to the. I need. We need to get Jeffrey to the airport right. at some point, and I want you all to buy books. That's why you're here, and I want to have them sign them. <coughs> okay. So um, let's, let's see. Maybe the gentleman. Okay. One, one, one final two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you wrote as William Jeffrey's uh, entire series of books. What prompted you to choose a pseudonym so early in your career? Yeah, the question was, I wrote a series of books, uh, the Location Scout books, uh, John Pell, under the name William Jeffers. That was a legal issue only. I was publishing with a different publishing company then, and I, uh, I was doing two books a year in my youth. I had much more energy. And uh, I, was, um, I talked to my main publisher, and they said, no, uh, we can't do two books of yours a year. It doesn't fit in our scheduling. You can go to another company, but you have to change your name. So I'll end this very quickly. I thought cleverly, what name should I pick? Well, um, I could do uh, Jeffrey, my first name is Jeffrey, Jefferies, uh, that's good, that'll be the last name, William, I just did. And I thought, Jeffreys, I like that, because why? In the bookstore, it's going to come right next to the K, and people are going to go buy a Stephen King book, and they're going to see, <laughs> I'm going to try this Jeffreys. And apparently Stephen King's sales were not harmed at all. <laughs> so quickly, before you sign books, you have a new book coming out, and you have a, a, a short on Kindle uh -huh. coming up. Tell us about that. Um, the, um, uh, the new book is called The Cutting Edge, uh, and it's about um, a murder in the, uh, a series of sick and twisted murders. I, I don't, if it's about a book I'm writing, I don't need to say sick and twisted. Uh, in the Diamond uh, District, and uh, apparently this psychotic fellow, it, for various reasons, um, is uh, very angry about the uh, people's unions, about getting married. And um, uh, so he's targeting people at bridal stores and when they get their engagement rings and so forth. And he does really nefarious uh, things for reasons that are sick and twisted or maybe something entirely different. Um, I do the Kindle singles uh, uh, on, uh, I do uh, long short stories. I honestly couldn't tell you which one is coming out soon because I write these a long time ago. I don't want to tell you. Yeah. Look on Kindle. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, you're the suspense and, guy. And also, yeah, and actually, if you want to read about the book, uh, there's a little button there that gives you more information. It's called Buy Now. <laughs> but it's only for information purposes. Now, on, Mike, so what are you coming up with next? We have to hear. My new, my new book is called Trust Me. It comes out um, August 28th. It's a psychological thriller, psychological standalone, about a, and a reporter covering a murder trial who begins to wonder, how does she write a true crime story without knowing the truth? You know the um, T.S. Eliot poem about name, the naming of cats, that there's the cats have the name we give them, the name they give themselves, and the singular, ineffable, inscrutable name that the universe gives them. And my main character begins to believe that that's what the truth is. There's the truth that we believe, there's the truth that the lawyers try to tell us in court, and then there's the singular, ineffable, and, so <coughs> and the name of the book is Trust Me, and it will be out August 28th. Looking forward to that, too. No pressure, it's just our career, you guys. <laughs> Thank you all for coming on. I guess